But let's not talk about those upsetting things. You probably would much rather hear about Franklin's triumph over polio. This was in the summer of 1920. We were at our summer cottage up at Campobello Island off the coast of Maine, and we'd spent the day out sailing, and there was a small fire on another island. We put that out. And when we got home, everyone was very hot, very tired. So Franklin and the children ran to the other side of the island where there was a swimming hole, and then they all ran back. And Franklin said he was feeling tired, so still wearing his wet bathing suit, he sat down to read the day's mail. And as it was getting close to supper time, he stood up and he said, didn't feel like eating at all. He wasn't feeling well. He was going upstairs to lie down. That was the last time he ever walked upstairs himself. Because by the next morning, he could hardly stand. And by the morning after that, he could not stand at all. We, of course, we sent for the doctor. He thought it was a cold with some sort of muscular thing. And then another very well-known doctor came up from Bar Harbor, I believe, and he also was mystified. Couldn't imagine what it was. Finally, after this had gone on for a week or 10 days, I received a telephone call from Franklin's uncle saying he thought Franklin ought to be examined by a specialist in infantile paralysis, polio. This was an entirely new idea to me, but I said, of course. So this doctor came up and examined him and at once pronounced it polio. I do think that in a way Franklin was relieved to finally know what this mysterious ailment was, but he never said a word. He just immediately began working, trying to get his muscles back. In fact, it seems to me I can recall his saying once, it was only a question of whether you lived long enough. If you did, he was sure you could get your muscles back. Now, Franklin's closest political advisor was this funny little man named Louis Howe, sort of a dwarf, always wearing rumpled clothes and covered with cigarette ash. And Louis said that I should begin working to keep Franklin's name alive. I've always wanted to be useful, so I began going out to meetings and giving speeches, and I discovered I could be Franklin's eyes and ears. Of course, Franklin had to teach me how to see things. It's not as easy as it sounds, you know, really seeing something. For instance, I once toured a hospital for the mentally ill. Well, I thought, I'd examined that one well. Franklin was waiting for me when I came out. He said to me, was it overcrowded? I hadn't the faintest idea. Well, were there beds in the corridors? Well, yes. Mm. What about the closets? Did they have beds stacked in there? It hadn't even occurred to me to look. What was the food like? Oh, that. That I knew all about. Oh, yes. I looked at the menus and they were all very good. Ah, but what was actually in the pots on the stoves? <laughs> After that, I understood. After that, I did not just look at menus. I would look in every pot on every stove. I would feel the mattresses and look at the shoes provided. Whether all of this was any help to my husband or not, I have no idea. But it helped me. Getting at the facts, learning to see what our institutions are really like, how they really operate. 
However, I did not dream of the White House. I knew what would traditionally lie before me, the teas and receptions. I cannot say I was exactly pleased at the prospect. When Franklin was elected in 1932, the turmoil in my heart was rather great. I think I was a rebellious first lady at first. For instance, I was told first ladies do not operate the elevators themselves. I told the head usher, I don't have time to wait for someone to come from the front door every time I want to go up and down stairs. This created a great deal of consternation at first, but finally I was allowed to run the elevator, which was quite an emancipation. <laughs> Certain White House duties which seemed futile to me I came to see had value. For instance, the teas. It seemed to me futile to receive 500 or 1,000 people in one afternoon, to shake hands with each one and pass them on to the state dining room for one cup of tea and one butter cookie. But I've come to see that to many Americans, the White House symbolizes government. And though standing and shaking hands is not very inspiring work, I think it well worthwhile. And I did it every winter, two or three times a week. But I did prefer to feel useful. If I could travel and talk to people, perhaps I could be useful to my husband. In 1934, very busy year for me, I traveled 43,000 miles and I gave 100 speeches. The Women's National Press Club told me I ought to go on strike for better working conditions. They even came up with posters that I could use. <clears throat> Union hours for first ladies <laughs> and no more than 300 handshakes a day. <laughs> and all this traveling is not a good way to make friends with everyone. Someone came up with a cartoon once. It shows two coal miners, many, many feet underground, working in the dark, shoveling coal. And one of them looks up and says to the other, well, for gosh sakes, here comes Mrs. Roosevelt. <laughs> you see why any woman in public life must have skin thick as rhinoceros hide. <laughs>